Okay, so um, our last speaker is Mr. Nikita Kusis um, from the School of Physiological Sciences of the University of Newcastle, Australia. So let's welcome Mr. Kukusis. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, yeah. What a fantastic set of talks. I feel very privileged to be up here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a way that we came up with um, me, Alex Venito, James Pang, uh, Jason and uh, Brian and Michael, and with the help of Peter Robinson. So we're going to be talking about a way to use geometric eigenmodes to generate surrogate brain maps, um, and these can be used for statistical inference. Um, this came out about as a desire from myself and my PhD supervisor, Michael, to re refine the process of spatial resampling that better replicates the spectral properties of the map while randomizing higher order features in the data, just like Fourier phase randomization can for time series. So I have no disclosures. Uh, so what is this method? Many of us are likely familiar with James Pang's eigenmodes paper, but I'm here to show you that eigenmodes can be used in a very different way. Uh, so firstly, this is no different from what J James did in the paper. We decompose a map into its spectral components, uh, the coefficients beta, uh, by projecting it onto the eigenfunctions of the Helmholtz equation, uh, or what they termed in the paper geometric eigenmodes, and what we term. Uh, we retain those coefficients, and do nothing with them for now. Uh, however, we exploit the group and frequency structure that uh, Gabe and Natasha Gabe and Robinson, Peter Robinson, uh, in 2017 showed, which demonstrated that cortical eigenmodes are equivalent to first order perturbations of spherical harmonics. Uh, so we leverage this discovery, transforming the modes to their equivalent spherical harmonics normalizing by the axis of the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues there, and then take them to a unit uh, ND sphere. We do this for every group, every eigenmode group. The reason we do this is because now the modes are invariant to rotation. This is analogous to phase randomization, but on a curved surface. So we spin the normalized modes and then reconstruct surrogate data by, normalize, by multiplying through the original coefficients that we derived before. So here are some examples of those surrogates in unsmooth uh, human connectome project task maps. And in those same maps, we preserve the spatial structure down to one millimeter. So here's the variogram. Uh, it shows the variance of the original map at all spatial separations in the black dots. And in red, we see the variance of uh, random permutations, so not our method, but just scrambling the data, and it's roughly flat. But we see that our method in blue follows the empirical variogram very closely. That's nice, but we wanted to find out whether we were still susceptible to spatial smoothness driving false positives. So what we did was derive a ground truth simulating randomly correlated pairs of Gaussian random fields. Gaussian random fields can be para parametrically smoothed with the parameter alpha, and so we increased alpha, generating uh, 1,000 GRF pairs at each alpha, going from complete white noise at alpha equals zero to data with about a 50 millimeter smoothing kernel at alpha equals four. So we're really putting our method through its paces. We know that these GRFs are on average uncorrelated, but we, what we found and what uh, Joshua Bird and Ross Markello found was that the uh, variance of the null distribution increases, increases dry, dramatically with the increase in alpha, and so we can really nail down where our method starts to break down. So for one map in all of the pairs across all alphas, we generated a thousand eigenstrapping surrogates, and of course we want to compare our method so we can repeat this process with the spin test and brain smash. So what we found was that when you correlate the eigenstrapping surrogates to the other map in the pairs, in other words, you derive a null distribution correlations, the width of the distribution increases in tandem with alpha, so it's looking good. The next plot here uh, shows that eigenstrapping in blue has the best error rate correction and it is indeed the only map, only method to provide expected type one error at 5% in smooth maps. 
The vast majority of brain maps lie in this range, highlighted by the black box, and we can consider this as the error rate corresponding to unsmoothed fMRI data to fMRI data smoothed with a two to four millimeter kernel uh, to data smoothed with a 20 millimeter kernel or something like PET data. Uh, I wanna make the point here, so in real situations with real fMRI data that you're very likely to encounter or any sort of spatial data, our performance is unmatched. Um, but of course, because the LBO, the Laplace Beltrami operator, eigenmodes can be solved on more than just the cortex, we tried it in subcortical maps. And that's the beauty of this method, it can be used on any surface. And we have an inference method for spatial maps located anywhere in the brain. These are three very different subcortical structures, the thalamus, the hippocampus, and the striatum. And here we show that eigenstrapping surrogates of cortical subcortical gradients, uh, here we show eigenstrapping surrogates of the gradients generated from HCP resting state data. Uh, despite these very different structures and hence very different modes, we found that eigenstrap maps had the same smoothness while permuting the data. We also show here that Moran's eye, a global measure of smoothness in this figure here, is retained much more significantly with eigenstrapping than with brain smash. Um, so how long does it take? Because, uh, yeah, you could have the best model in the world, but it wouldn't end capture all the variants, but we uh, don't have until the heat death of the universe to calculate these models. Oh, it's worth pointing out how long these things take. So we found that eigenstrapping to generate a thousand surrogates, which is a good you know, starting point for uh, deriving a null distribution, with one CPU thread, it takes about on average uh, eight minutes for the FS average five surface with 10,000 vertices and it takes about 35 minutes with the um, FSLR 32,000 surface. And in subcortical data, it takes about, it takes, often takes less than five minutes. Very often takes about a minute. Uh, and comparably, like the spin test in the FS average five takes about five minutes, and brain smash takes about 90 minutes. So you can see we're comparable to other methods better in some ways. Um, so what about higher order effects? Well, what I wanna show here is what I imagine doing when Michael makes me do too much, <laughs> is I project his face to my brain and I spin it in my head and I can, I can strap it as well. But seriously, what I wanna show here is that we can take an immediately recognizable object like a face full of third order and fourth order correlations, project it to the cortex and see whether we can randomize those features. So in this video, I'll play it again, uh, we can see that the spin test simply just rotates the patterns while eigenstrapping, which should come up in a second, completely destroys them. And the interesting thing here is that the, both, all of these maps here that I'm showing uh, have the same low order autocorrelation, the same smoothness. Uh, but clearly one is a much more well-formed null. So, uh, with that, uh, we would like to we would like everyone to get out there and use it. So we have a GitHub and a preprint which you can check out with the QR code there, uh, or the link in the down in the bottom right corner. Uh, so please go check it out. And we've done a very uh, well. I, me myself has I've spent many hours uh, exhaustively documenting every um, function in there. So and got some tutorials as well and some demos. So hopefully you can find it very simple to use. Um, and I would like to thank the Systems Neuroscience Group in Newcastle and my co-authors, Jason, Brian, James, Alex, and Bratislav, who have all given me some very good advice and some, uh, well, I have a lot of help. And uh, thanks go to Peter Robinson, who is a genius. And of course, to my uh, PhD supervisor, Michael, who came up with the original idea. I only made it work. Uh, if you'd like to, to see more, you can find me at my poster. I'll be at uh, poster 1856. And uh, three other postdocs from my lab, um, Saurabh, Jason, and Anna will be here as well. I'm sorry, Saurabh, the, uh, I forgot your poster number. Um, but Jason will be at 1968, and Anna will be at 2155. Um, thank you for listening.
Thank you very much, Nikitas. So, any questions from the audience? Um, if not, I have uh, one question from the app. Um, the distinction between the spin test and the eigenstrapping in terms of false positives seems to be unclear. Can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I mean, it's in our testing, we found it was pretty similar. Um, yeah, but you can see it's a, I guess if your ideal is 5%, then eigenstrapping reaches that. It's simple there. But um, I guess to say it is, the spin test should provide the 5%, and we don't quite know why it doesn't. Um, I guess there's more testing to be had, but may, we're not here to prove the spin test, I suppose. We're just comparing. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, I do need to apologize, apologize again for all the valuable uh, questions that cannot be mentioned here. And due to the time limits, let's thank all the speakers and staff and for all the audience who are attending this session again. Thank you very much. And please uh, remember to fill out the session evaluation. It's available right, right now. Thank you. <laughs>